Tonight I want to encourage you, if I can, from the book of 2 Corinthians and chapter number 8. The book of 2 Corinthians and chapter number 8. Most preachers, when they preach from the chapter 8 and chapter 9 of the book of 2 Corinthians, it deals priority mostly with faith promise giving. The idea, you know, how to give, you know, he that, uh, you know, if you give uh, bountifully, you'll, you know, reap bountifully, that, that, that type of idea. But I want to I wanna focus in on, on a little bit different perspective uh, because I, I, one thing I've learned as I've been in the ministry and one of the things my dad, uh, as he trained me for the ministry, uh, taught me or tried to teach me when I was young. It's kind of hard when you're young. You don't want to learn, you know. And so it, may, it took some experience of life where I could kind of wise up and, you know, get the, the two by four over the head before I realized, you know, really what my dad was talking about when I was young. But uh, attitude makes a difference. Your attitude will make a difference in your service for God. Now, we can have all the qualifications. Uh, we can have all the talents. We can have all the know-how and all the experience. But if we have a bad attitude, it's just not going very far. We're not going to reach people in our life as we minister, whether it be a missionary or a church member or, or a, a piano player or whatever part of life you're in in your Christian walk. Your priority in life is to reach others for Christ, to be an influence in other people. You know, we understand that our first priority is to glorify God in all we do. We understand that. But we, we, we work with people. We, we come in contact with people. And we realize that people need the Lord. And that's, that's where we are. And that's what we, try to, uh, that's what we try to minister is to people. But we see a, 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 an example here of a church uh, that uh, some things are happening. I just want to read chapter uh, uh, 8 and just a verse, a first couple of five verses tonight and share some things from the Word of God. The Bible tells us here, 2 Corinthians Chapter 8, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in, in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded into riches of their liberality. For to their power are by record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of first things first. First things first. Now, if we were to take this little church and uh, we would probably and put them in a, uh, on a, um, an order of success list, they probably wouldn't be number one on the list. This was a church that was struggling. Uh, they didn't have a lot of finances. They, they, they had, had a hard time just, just keeping things together. Uh, they were really struggling in life. And, and verse, number, uh, verse number two says they had great trial. They had affliction, uh, but they had joy in their affliction. And they had deep poverty. And all these things we see that was going on in their life. Uh, uh, but uh, the Lord picks out this church to, to be an example of our attitude, of our attitude and how we live our life. And now in this, now in this case, it talks about uh, uh, a church that was wanting to help and uh, help others as they serve God and minister to the saints. But I think we can t apply it to our lives. That, you know, it doesn't matter what circumstance we're in life, we can have a good attitude. We can be a blessing to someone else. Amen. We can be a blessing. And you know, everywhere you go, you meet people who are having problems and have, and have a difficulty in life. They've had a crisis in their life. And that's where we need to be a help and encourager to them. Uh, we need to understand this. We need to have priorities in our life as Christians. In Matthew chapter 6, and verse number 33, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God is to be number one in our life. He is our priority. Whatever we do, whatever we say, however we act, needs, needs to come by, uh, by the Word of God or by what God thinks about us in our life. You know, we go out and we witness, we talk to people, and, and many times it, it, it's the idea, well, you know, I'll do what I want to, and then if God likes it, that's fine, and He approves it. Or I make my plan and ask God to, to, to back up my plan. That's not the way it works. It's what we want to, we, we, we give ourselves to the Lord and say, Lord, here we are. Here's what I am. It's not much, Lord, but you take it and then you tell me what you want me to do. And we need to have that kind of attitude. And this is exactly what was going on in the life of this church uh, as we see this. I want to share three things tonight quickly about the first things first. Number one, we see in verse number five, and this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave themselves to the Lord. I think uh, after serving the Lord on the foreign mission field, I meet a lot of missionaries and I meet a lot of pastors and 
uh, we're in a lot of churches, and um, we understand that the idea that, uh, you know, if you're going to serve God, we must be willing to give ourselves to the Lord. That has to be number one. Uh, we must be willing to say, Lord, it's not my life, it's your life. And Lord, it's not what I want, it's what you want. Lord, it's not my direction or my plans or my way of figuring things out. It's your way, it's your plan, it's your idea. You plan to let me, help, let me know what you want to do. And so we see here uh, an attitude of letting God be first and giving ourselves. This, these people in this church in Macedonia uh, had the priorities right. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Many times we try to do our work for the Lord and our own power. We try to fabricate our own plan. We try to have it all worked out just right, you know, and we try to make a business out of God's work. We can't do that. It doesn't work that way. God is the one that makes things work. And in this church, these people realize that God must be number one and they must be giving themselves to the Lord. How do we do this? It just talks about a submission to the Savior. Uh, if, if I'm going to give myself to the Lord and say, Lord, you're, uh, you know, I am yours, it talks about a submission. I have to submit myself to what God wants me to do. I have to submit my desires to the Lord. You know, I, I had desires of being something great. I had my desires of being a rich man. I had my desires of owning a home someday. You know, I don't even own a home. You know, I, I, realized I, I, I had great aspirations of living the American dream. I grew up in the country of, of Africa. And I came home and age, well, we came home to the States at the age of nine. The only thing I knew about America is that they sold all you could, all you could eat ice cream, you know. That's all I knew. You can go to America and get ice cream. And uh, I went at the age of 12, went to the country of Spain, grew up as a missionary kid there. And I thought, man, if one day, if I ever get back to America, I'm really, I'm going to have the American dream. But I tried to do that. And I found out the American dream isn't all it cracked up to be. And, um, and I realized what needed to be done was to get myself to the Lord. And God reminded me very quickly that at a young age, I had surrendered my life to the Lord. And uh, I'm glad he did. I'm glad he turned, my, turned my, my desires around. And now my desire is not for me. Man, I'm not in Spain to make a name for Jonathan Lyons. I don't care if my name gets written or anything. What I want is to make God glorified. I want God to get the glory because it's he, he's the one that called. My desire is what pleases him. It needs to be in all of our lives. Then it talks about a submission only to the Savior in our desires, but in our development. You know, uh, God has a specific area of ministry or area of service for you. You say, well, Lions, I'm not called to be a missionary. That's all right. But God, if you're a Christian, God has something special for you to do. I mean, if you're a Christian, you're somebody. I don't know any nobodies in God's service. Everybody's a somebody. You're important to God. But I must be willing to, for, for God, for in order for me to do what God wants me to do, I have to be willing to let God develop me in those areas. I was a young missionary when I went out to Spain over 19 years ago. Uh, and, uh, man, I was a missionary kid. I thought I had it all together. Man, I knew the language, I knew the culture, I knew the people. I mean, I, I said, man, if anyone's going to have success on the mission field, it's going to be old me. After about a year and a half, I landed flat on my face, and I realized, you know, Jonathan Lyons can't do anything. It's going to be done. It's going to be through God. And God had to do a lot of work in my life. God had to mold me, had to humble me in very uh, a lot of ways. And I'm so, so thankful he did, because if he had not, I would guarantee you I would not be here tonight doing what I'm doing, and I thank the Lord for having grace and mercy in my life. And so we, uh, just giving ourselves talk, uh, talks about a submission to the Savior, then talks about a selflessness of self. These people, when they gave themselves to the Lord, you got to understand, uh, they were giving up a lot of things. Uh, people were really really killing them. People were treating them bad. And when someone said, I want to surrender to God, they were pretty much cut off of society. And they were humble enough to say, God, do whatever you want to do with my life. I realize tonight, and I hope you do, that there's no room for pride in our service for God. I've seen many missionaries and seen pastors and Christians in their own church in Spain that, you know, they got a little bit of knowledge and they say, hey, I know it all now. And now you can't find them anywhere in the other church house. They're out doing their own thing, making money somewhere. We can't be full of pride. We must be full of, hum of humbleness, of kindness, loving one another. Then it talks about not only in our giving to ourselves a submission to the Savior and a selflessness of self, but a supplying for the saints. In verse number 4, we see here, they're praying. They pray us with much entreat that we would receive the gift and then take upon us the fellowship of the ministry of the saints. This church desired to help missionaries and to help Paul and to help those around. They didn't want to keep everything for themselves. They wanted to help others. And that's our attitude. We want to help. As you see the, the faces on the slides, you realize that as you gave, and many of you, I understand, 
Uh, don't, don't think that uh, uh, we take it for granted what you, what you send our way. I understand it's sacrifice, sacrifice on your part. I don't know anybody here tonight probably makes more money, have more money than need, but and some of you may not be making it in the in the month. But we understand it's a sacrifice. You give sacrificially, but God takes what you give, uh, as you have given, and multiplies it, and the people and the faces you see as a result of your giving to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you supply for the saints. And so we see, first of all, we need to give ourselves. And then another first we see in the same verse of number five, as says, and the second part, and unto us. By the will of God, he gave himself to the Lord, and then they gave by the will of God. Let me ask you tonight, do you pray about everything you do? I mean, uh, when you go to the grocery store, do you pray and ask, Lord, now give me wisdom as I buy so I can spend my money wisely? Do you pray about the vehicle you're going to buy? Do you pray about uh, the investments you're going to do? Do you pray about a job change or a church change or anything like that? All these things need to be prayed about. Find out, Lord, is this your will or my desire? If I had my desire and my will, man, I would have quit many years ago. If I had my will, man, I would have done something a whole, a whole lot different, personally speaking, because it's not being easy to be a missionary. We've had a lot of people talk about us. We've had people, uh, make churches drop us. We've had people uh, criticize us. We've had nationals turn their back on us. And it's not always been fun. But it was those times when I knew that it was God's will that kept me going and kept me being faithful in the mission field. They said they gave by the will of God. This speaks of study. Studying the word of God. The Bible says study shall itself approved unto God. A work when it needeth not to be ashamed. Uh, I meet people all the time and you know, I talk to them about their study, and they, oh, I don't read the Bible that much. You know, Christians, good Christians, don't read the Bible. Don't study the Word of God. Don't take time to spend time with the Lord. It takes study to know God's will. It takes security to get God's direction. You only secure as you read God's Word. It speaks of separation to God and to His will, doing what He wants and not our, not our wants. Then it speaks of a service and serving the Lord. And being faithful in our service to Him. You know, it talks about a submissive service. Submissive service. There's that word submission again. Many times we have to be submissive. And many times we don't understand what God's doing in our life and the life of someone else. But we have to be willing to be submissive. Lord, you know what's best for me. You know exactly what's happened. We've gone through, since, uh, since we were here last, uh, we went through a situation and we went from 50 people down to 15 people. I mean, within a, within a month's time. And some people that we love dearly and still love turned their back on us and hurt us really, really bad. And we were very discouraged. And I had to be submissive to God's direction and say, God, you know, I thought, well, this, man, this is time for me to bail out. Man, I, I thought, man, this is time to change, change, change boats. This one's sinking. <laughs> I'll go somewhere else. But God said, no, this is where you need to stay. And we stayed and we stayed and now have over 60 people in service. Not, not, that's not, I'm not the, an eloquent preacher. You see by hearing me tonight, I'm not the most eloquent preacher in the world. I'll do better in Spanish, I think. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't, have, I don't have all of my ducks in a row, and I'm not the, the most eloquent missionary you might ever see. But God chose to use us. Mm -hmm. And just us being not, uh, just simple old people, God could use us to have impact in people's life. Then we see that, Many times, not only is it submissive service, but it's a strenuous service. Have you ever heard the idea that being a Christian is only for sissies? Well, you try being a Christian. You try living every day for the Lord. You try taking a stand. You try being separated from the world and being separated to God. You just try that and see if that's not hard work. It's strenuous at times. In your country, like where we, where we are, many times when a person comes to know Christ as their Savior, their family cuts them off and says, oh, we'll have nothing to do with you anymore. You're not welcome back in the home. Uh, we'll, have, we'll not talk to you anymore. Your kids are not our, not our grandchildren anymore. And that's hard. That's difficult. And they go to work and they say, oh, you're a Christian. Oh, well, man, we won't pay you this month. And, ask, and what are you going to do? It's difficult. But God works in our lives. But then we understand that serving God is a satisfying service. Man, when I tell you what, it, it, uh, it pleases me to come here and to see the, you know, you're not in a storefront church anymore. This is, this is wonderful. This is, I praise the Lord for this. 
And I, I saw you in another place, and you were wall-to-wall -wall seats and kind of crapped up in there. And, and I remember Pastor praying, and I remember y'all praying for a building. And now to come and see, man, this, this is wonderful. And now that you're packed out and need something else, well, you know, God's done this. He can do more. It's nothing impossible for God. And, you know, it's just, and that's great. Just keep going on. But that's satisfying to know that it's God that did it. And God gives you satisfaction in your work for Him. As we see people in Spain, you know, we many, some of these, uh, as I mentioned, a couple there, eight, eight years of praying. Uh, we, they've been in our home. We've been in their home eating. Uh, we've done activities to try to get them involved, and them as well as others, and, and spend many hours trying to explain the Word of God. Every preacher come through, man, I take them to the house, hey, you talk to them. Maybe you can explain it some other way that I, I missed, you know. And uh, after eight years, see them come to bow their knee before Christ. Boy, that, that, that's satisfying. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah, that makes you happy because you know that God has changed the life. So we see they gave themselves to the Lord. Then they gave by the will of God. And then in verse number 12 of chapter 8, we see here, For if there be first a willing mind. This talks about a willing disposition to be used of God. To place yourself in a position to where you can be used. M setting up your mind and your heart and your life to where, God, pick me. Pick me. As my daughter sang tonight, talks about the verse in Isaiah, here am I, send me, Lord. But Isaiah didn't say that because he had nothing else to do. He had placed himself in a position to where he could say, here am I, send me. You know, I, I've done what I need to do. I, I've been, I, I, I've, I, you know, he, God worked him over pretty good. And he came to the point and said, Lord, here am I, man. Pick me, you know. And how many of us are just jumping and say, hey, God, pick me, pick me. You know, if you go to a kindergarten class or a junior church, you know, and, and you've got, you got some balloons up here with water in them. And you say, man, uh, who would like to pop, uh, throw a water balloon? You don't have a, you don't have a, you got every hand. Uh, hear me, me, I want to do it, I want to do it. Pick me, pick me. But what if we were that way about God's service? And we got something better to do than throw a water balloon. We got God's word to share with a lost and dying world. Speaks of a willing mind. Makes making conscious choices in our personal life. Pray before you make a choice. I hear people come. We come they come to our church many times and they think I'm the uh, uh, job provider for Spain, I think. And they come here, preacher, I need a job. I'm like, you know. Uh, you know, and there's somebody, I need a job. And so I, I will pray with them and try. And, and I tell them, I said, well, we'll pray for you, but we pray on, with certain conditions. And they said, well, what's that, preacher? And I said, well, I said, we'll pray that to God give you a job where you can be here every service on Sunday. And pray that God will be, uh, give you a job that you can be here on Thursday night in prayer service. And that you can be here on Fridays and Saturdays when we have men's prayer meetings and stuff like that. And they said, well, preacher, there's, there's nothing available. I said, if you pray about it, God will give you that. And you know what? God's given them jobs with it. It can be done Sunday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Thursday night, and, uh, and so on. But you have to pray for that. Make choices that where you can be in God's will and be in God's place. Make, uh, 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 make conscious choices in your life choices, in your spiritual choices. This piece of marking God's goodness. You know, if he was here tonight and we had time and, and everybody would go through several lines, I remember what God done for me. I mean, how many remember something good that God's done for you? If you're saved, that's one at least, you know, okay? We, can, we all be agree on that. It's hard to get a bunch of, bunch of bad ones to agree on anything, but that one we can agree on, all right? And, uh, but speaks of God's goodness. Has God been good to you? Amen. I mean, how many of you uh, missed a meal because you just had to, you know? Some of us miss meals because we need to, but uh, it won't go there. That's something I need to work on. So, uh, but, but God's been good to us. We have our needs supplied. We got a car to drive. We got a home to live in. We got food on the table. We got a little bit of money in the bank. Even it's a dollar. We got some money there. You know, God's been good. He supplied our need. And He'll supply your need now. He'll supply your need now. Then as you look at that, you can have confidence that God will supply your need in the future. He's not going to leave you hanging out, hanging out to dry. He's got, he's, got, uh, he's got things for you to do. He's got, uh, he'll supply your need. And then we, it speaks of, of magnifying God's sufficiency. You know what? God never fails. Not one time. All these years of service on the mission field. My wife and I went out as, as a newlyweds at 21 years old. No kids. Fancy free. Jumped into the ministry. And I said, you know, and I look back and say, man, well, I was dumb. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no experience. 
left for the mission field. We've been married. Uh, we got married in January of 89. And by May of the same year, we sold everything we owned and began deputation. And a little over a year later, we were on the mission field and been there ever since. But you know, even those times, in the first couple years, we only we lived on $900 a month support. And the dollar was not very good even back then. And we were only got about 90 cents, you know, something like that. And uh, we had an apartment. We couldn't turn the heat on because we couldn't pay, the, couldn't pay the heat. And we had a car, but I couldn't drive it because I couldn't afford to put gas in it. And it looked pretty. It was always clean, but I couldn't drive it anywhere. And, uh, you know, we had to, and we fixed up a room out there. And, and uh, we were visiting a military couple one night. And, and for Thanksgiving, they were gracious enough to invite us for Thanksgiving. And, and so we were over there, and I walked, we drove up to the carport, and there's a big roll of that rust-colored shag carpet. I don't know if you all remember that. I used to put that in all the mobile homes. Well, he brought that thing all the way over there from California. And it's just sitting there in his garage. And, and I told him, I said, Brother, I said, uh, what are you going to do with that carpet? He said, you know, I said, he said, I brought the thing over here. He said, I just don't like it. I think we'll throw it away. I said, wait a minute. I said, I can use that. <laughs> he said, you want it? I said, yeah. So, man, we put that thing back on the top of the car, and I hold that thing across, across Madrid back to the, where we lived. And, and, man, I fixed up a room. We had, I had nice shag rust carpet, but I tell you what. In that room, we had an office, and there was a living room, and there was our dining room, and, and I sleep because it was the only room I could heat. And that shag carpet held the heat real good. And we lived there nine months in that little room. My mother-in-law sent us nine months worth of romaine soup. My wife fixed romaine soup every which way you could think of. We survived, but I told my mother-in-law there, I said, Mom, I love you, but please don't send me no romaine soup. I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand to go down the walk by the aisle anymore. And we ate it, every, ate it so much. But God was good. He supplied our need. God is sufficient in every one of our lives. Now we can look over, you know, four kids later, you know, a little more aged than we were before, a little bit, uh, uh, a lot fatter than we used to be. Uh, you know, God's been good. He's been sufficient for every need. You know what? You don't have to be a missionary for God to be your sufficiency. If you're a child of God tonight and make some first things first, Put Him first in your life. Make His will your priority. And keep yourself and your mindset open. God, here I am. I'll be used anyway. Just, just, you, just pick me. But keep that attitude. You'll realize that God is good all the time. He never fails.